So the chainsaw powered go-kart comment in the last video, I mean, it was a bit of a joke, but you know, it put some gears in motion. I started thinking about all the old hardware I had laying around, just collecting dust, and all of a sudden the idea began crystallizing in my mind. I might actually have enough stuff to pull this off. This is my old chainsaw, and it looks like my wife put it away dirty. I'm so embarrassed. This saw hasn't seen a hard day's use in five or six years easy, ever since I got the bigger steel saw. Last time it was even started was probably two, if not three years ago. This is now my loner saw. This is the saw I lend my neighbor. Yeah, I guess now I know why he hasn't come asking for it in a while. For as much flack as these saws get, I have to be honest, it's never given me lip in the 10 years I've had it. My steels are more temperamental than this thing is. I think this thing has a Husqvarna engine in it. I just thought I'd light that fire. Anyway, I only really replaced it because it's started to wear out. Not the engine, but like the entire saw. Shake it by the handle and it moves like a belly dancer. This is, if I'm not mistaken, a 46cc saw. Maybe 42? Something in there. I have no idea how much horsepower this little engine can put out. One horsepower, maybe? Though it is a bit old. Half a horse? Whatever it is, it isn't a lot. Now, I do have a couple of electric motors, but unfortunately my longest extension cords are only about 25 foot. Nonetheless, I'd like to try to make it work. It's really only going to be pushing around a couple of scrawny kids anyway. Now, on top of that, I'm not trying to build a Formula One cart. Max speed I'd like to shoot for is maybe 20, 25 miles per hour. And even that might be fast. But it'll make a lot of noise, and I'm pretty sure that's the point. Using a small power plant means I'm going to have to try to make the cart as light as possible. Not a death trap, but light as possible. Okay, well, it needs a little more cleaning, but that looks to be about it. So, for wheels, I had to go and buy these. I didn't just have them laying around. Now, if you do what I did and go look for go-kart wheels on eBay, you'll find one of two types. Very expensive racing wheels with like Dunlop tires. And then you'll find these. These were about $15 import. And seeing them in person, well, it'd be a stretch to even call them hand truck wheels. The hubs and rims are thin pressed sheet metal. Now, although they might work okay in a cart situation, like a hand truck, I don't know how much side loading they'd reliably take or for how long for that matter. I'd trust these wheels about as far as I could throw them. Actually scratch that, I could probably throw these pretty far. I plan to reinforce these hubs, particularly for the drive wheels, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So big picture, I want this engine to turn these wheels of course, and the first step will be to figure out how to connect the dots. Now I'm not 100% sure, but this engine at top speed with no load probably does an excess of 10 to 12,000 RPM. And although that's great for cutting wood or giving mom a heart attack, it's way too fast for what I needed to do. I've got to gear it down. And gearing it down also serves to get back some of the torque and hopefully turn this into the little engine that could. My first inclination was to add a chain, like a low gear on a bicycle, and I'd imagine that's how most of these things are done. But if we do some quick math, the largest gear I could get on the tire is say 10 inches, which would actually mean the gear is actually touching the ground because the wheel is 10 inches too, but we'll use 10 to make the math easy. 
the largest gear I could get on the saw and still clear the chain, I guess that'd be a sprocket. The largest sprocket I could get on the saw and still clear the chain is maybe three inches. So 10 divided by three is three and a third. That would drop the axle RPM from 10,000 to 3,000, which is still too fast, I think, and really only nets me about three times the torque on the ground. So in this case, I think I need a bigger gear reduction. Which leads me to the other worm drive that you may remember from the rotary weld table build video. I'll put a card up here in the corner for that. This gearbox does a 10 to 1 reduction. That's three times more than the simple chain drive. It has the added benefit of being completely enclosed. So I don't have to worry about small fingers getting into a chain drive. All right, so what you just didn't hear was essentially a long-winded brain fart. Let's just put it behind us and make pretend it didn't happen, shall we? A worm drive isn't going to work here, as it can't be back-driven. Meaning, if the input doesn't move, the output doesn't move. If the saw isn't running, or like the kids are stepping on the brake, the gearbox, rear axle, and wheels would be locked up. So let's take a 15-minute break. I'll get my acts together, and we'll regroup. I recently got a new toy. Tool. A cordless angle grinder. I got what I think was a good price on it from Amazon. I bought the tool only, no batteries. So far, it's been a lot of fun. I can't tell you how long I've wanted one of these. It does run slower, though, than its corded counterpart, but uh, it seems to do the trick. Consequently, it's also a little quieter. I mean, sort of. What it's really good at, though, is stealing bicycles. So can anyone give me one legitimate reason why every part of a bicycle requires four specialized tools to remove? I wanted the sprockets out of this and I just couldn't break this thing down. And I have a machine shop. So I threw in the towel and I walked into my local bike shop. They pulled all of this stuff out of their trash and just dumped it in my lap. So now I feel like a sucker having risked life imprisonment when all I needed to do was ask. These parts do have some wear and tear, but I think I've got enough of them to pick a few good ones. So it's still the same plan, just the execution is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to get one of these on the saw and the large one probably on the drive shaft. Then there'll be an intermediate gear that hopefully gets me to the speed reduction that I need. The saw already has a sprocket behind this clutch. I'm going to have to remove this clutch so I can install the right sprocket to take the bike chain. Now, I don't know if this is the smartest way to do this, but I'm going to stuff the engine with as much rope as I can just so it doesn't the piston doesn't move and I can unscrew that clutch. There are special tools for this that I don't have, or the inclination to make. Really? So there's the sprocket I have to change. So here's a better look at the backside. That's the sprocket to drive the chainsaw chain, of course. There was a small needle bearing in here. I just kind of pressed it out to keep from doing damage while I make the modification. I also separated one of the smaller sprockets. Now I was hoping I would have found somewhat of a larger sprocket on the chainsaw side or a smaller hole in the bike sprocket just so I could make a real nice fit up. But to make that modification it's kind of a pain in the butt. It sort of fits enough I think to get it centered, just doesn't give me a lot of places to attach to. I did make a bit of a spacer ring, just sort of set the gap between the bike sprocket and the bell of the clutch here. That just sets the clearance on the bottom to make sure the chain doesn't really rub anywhere. I plan to TIG weld this in place, as solid of a weld as I can get, given that I have six attachment points. Now these sprockets are not hardened. I mean they're hardish, but they're not hardened. The thing I don't know is just how high of a carbon content they have, and when I go to weld them, if I cause more harm than good. But if the welds do fail, it's not catastrophic. I mean the cart won't run, but these will be protected inside sort of the chain cover of the saw. I would just have to break it down and do it right the second time. All 
All right, despite that wagon wheel look, I think I feel pretty all right about that. Like in the puddle, I know I got 100% fusion on the bike sprocket, and it looks like it took pretty well to whatever this sprocket is made out of. Given that there's a centrifugal clutch in the back and the amount of weight that will effectively be going through this chain, I don't think this thing is going to see any really sudden starts. No real shock loading to those welds. The chain fits nice with plenty of clearance in the back. I'm just going to clean up this top face that sits up against the body of the saw, put the bearing back in, and reinstall the clutch. I'm going to finish that up nice and slow on the press, which is probably what I should have done in the first place. While I'm here, I think I'm going to take off some of these Mad Max features for now. At least until they start to get into some competitive racing, maybe. Long time no talk. We should catch up sometime. You should have just seen me build the wheel hubs and install them. The lug nuts are a little long, I know, but I needed them to pull the tires closed on the split rims. That, and it turns out I don't have shorter ones. I'm building this around a 3 quarter inch or 19 millimeter cold rolled drive shaft. Doing this by eye and it looks about right. I also built hubs for the large sprocket and a disc brake. I pulled a front brake system out of a local junkyard, came off an old scooter or dirt bike. It's a little bigger than I was hoping for. You can see it doesn't leave a ton of ground clearance, but neither does the sprocket. You may notice none of the hubs are keyed to the shaft. As is, this cart won't go very fast. Now, in the interest of an expedient build, I'm going to go with my patented, 100% guaranteed, maintenance-proof assembly method. I'm going to weld all the hubs in place, but I'm going to make the entire rear axle removable from the frame. I don't expect problems, but if something does go wrong, I've left myself enough space on the hubs to be able to cut them behind the welds. That way I really only lose about two and a half or three feet of the three quarter inch cold rolled. Just to be clear, this is not the correct way to do things. So next comes the tricky bit. I have to decide how big I want to make this thing. I'd like to keep it light, so preferably it'd be small. That'd make it easier to move around and fit in my car. But I don't want it to be tippy. Fast, tight turns are probably inevitable, and I'd prefer not to have this thing roll over. All right, I'm back. In order to get these sizes figured out, I had to take a little break to find a seat. It's seen some hard times, but I think it's got a little bit of life still in it. So I think it's the right size for my kids, but it's a little bit bigger than I was expecting. Be honest, the thing that's bumming me out the most is it doesn't really have a lot of style. 
Anyway, beggars can't be choosers. I think I'm going to go for about 28 inches. That's something over 70 centimeters. I'll see. Maybe I can play with how it sort of sits in the frame to make it kind of like less prominent. But to be fair, it's probably a good safe like bucket style seat for the kids. The saw may end up kind of outboard of the rear bumper. Not really what I was going for, but I think I should be able to make it work. Anyway, with this stuff, I think I can take a shot now. It's starting to bend up the start of the frame. As far as tubing goes on hand, I've got a fair amount of these sizes. This is about 5 eighths, 60 thou wall, and then I've got inch, might be inch and an eighth. I've got it in heavy wall and thinner wall. The problem is I have a lot more of this bigger stuff, but it's in shorter pieces. I have enough of the small stuff in longer sections that I think it might be easier to use this and bend it instead of weld up a lot of, you know, shorter pieces. I think like a three quarter, maybe a 19 or 20 millimeter light section square tube would have probably been the best, but I'm trying to work with what I got here. Anyway, using this smaller stuff means I'm going to have to go with more of like a space frame kind of 3D trusses and a little more complicated, but again, it's easier to bend and I've got it in some longish pieces. What I don't have, though, is a die for the bender to bend this size tubing. I'm going to whip one of those up, do a quick test bend or two, and just see how it goes. All right, well, all told, it didn't come out too bad. It did turn out an inch wider than I intended it to. I think I failed to take into account two tube widths. It's the dimension that I want on the inside. I wanted it on the outside. The other one that got me is that bend there. This wraps over the axle. There'll be a bearing plate, like a support plate, and the bearing will go in here. I wanted that bend to be closer to this bearing. I had to flip this over in the bender, and then the two and a half inches that get taken up by the bend, I put the mark on the wrong side. It just means I'm going to have to make the bearing plate a little bit longer. I'm going to do that next, but first let's go back to the bender. So on the bender, I've got the die that I'm bending around, of course, set up in the center. On the trailing side, there's a fixed block, square block, and on the leading side, there's a like a round die, a wheel, I guess. I'm going to make a mark on the tubing right at the back edge of this square block, just as a point of reference. Try to pull a 90 degree bend, and you watch that mark with respect to all of the bending. Heck, I'll put a mark over here too, on the roller. Now with a setup like this, what you want to happen is have the roller roll the stock that you're bending around the die. We don't want this to move in the back. And in practice, it'll probably pull it a bit. So on really complicated or something with a lot of bends where you get some kind of like a, a big tolerance stack up at the end, you may want to clamp these so it, it really doesn't move. But let me pull this bend around. So you can see that mark didn't move, so this dimension on the left-hand side would be reliable. So there's the bend. The die is doing pretty good, but maybe you can see where this mark used to be. This mark used to be right there. So now this is just a sample bend, but if you don't take into account where this extra material is going to wrap, like if it's going to wrap inside or outside your dimension, this part will either be two inches long or two inches short. And that's what happened here. I meant to pull this curve on this side of the mark so it would end up here, but instead I got the dimension I marked off plus the bend and just made it longer than I wanted. I think that's what happened anyway. All right, the bearing plates. I'm going to chop up a couple of pieces of cold rolled steel, put some holes in it, and weld it into the frame. I've got both bearing plates welded in, and hopefully you can see once the bolts come out of the bearings, the axle can drop right out of the bottom. 
Now I want to make a second piece that sort of adds structure to the frame and gives me some attachment points for the saw and brake caliper, that kind of stuff. Flesh the frame out a little bit, basically. So this turned out to be about 19 and a quarter inches. That's almost 49 centimeters. In a project like this, the first bends are tend to be the easiest because, well, there's nothing else they need to match up to. The second and subsequent bends are going to have to match this first bend. I've already got one of the corners bent on this piece, and I'm about to put in the second bend, which sets the width. Now, instead of doing the math, I think I'm just going to show you the math. I want this to be 19 and a quarter when it's finished. And I'm going to use the test bend we did earlier to set that up. So if I set this at 19 and a quarter mark on the outside that I see on the table, there's the mark, the reference mark we took before up against the fixed block of the bender. I'm just going to transfer that to the tubing I want to bend, and that hopefully gets us the right size. Okay, that fits surprisingly well. That'll float, I don't know, about two inches above. I'm going to try to guess at a good dimension and sort of fill this thing out, weld it up. Okay, I think that saw is in there pretty good. I may add a gusset or two, but it'll have to wait until I know where the sprocket and chain goes. That said, I'm very tempted to use just one chain. I mean, it'd be so easy, but that'd only net me maybe a three or four to one reduction. I'd hoped to finish the whole back end, but I think I'm gonna stop part one right about here. There's really not that much left to it. I still have to route the chain or the chains. I'm still undecided what to do there. If anyone has any experience with this or a really strong gut feel, I'd love to hear your take on it. But basically it's the chain and a similar bracket to mount a brake caliper on the right hand side. You may have noticed that there's only half a frame, just the back end. That's because I planned to add a bit of suspension to this. I think I'm going to put a hinge in right behind the seat and add one or two big springs. Again, still not 100% sure, just playing this by ear. That might be overkill, but I thought it'd be a nice touch. Anyway, next time we'll finish this back end where I'll catch you up with where I am by then, and we'll start some work on the front side. Front half of the frame, controls, steering column, linkages, that kind of stuff. Anyway, hope you like that. Thanks for watching.